Hi all, welcome back for <clears throat> another week of cultural anthropology. We're in week five now. Um, yeah, not too much housekeeping. I'm trying to. I'm going to try to get through this because I've kind of assigned some lengthy videos and uh, material for this week. So we're going to try to um, get through this in, in just a couple uh, lecture segments this week. Barring my uh, ability to go off on tangents here. Um, so modes of reproduction is, I would say it's one of those areas that tends to not be discussed a lot when we talk about different groupings of people. And when we talk about groups of people, especially when we're talking about how they survive or subsistence, we tend to talk about their socioeconomic um, makeup or status. Um, we also talk about sociopolitical, which is kind of their political organization. Um, and really, if we include socioeconomic political, we're really kind of combining the whole structure there. Uh, reproduction, a lot of that is not very well known to most people, uh, especially outside of anthropology, especially when we're talking about groups of foraging people. A common misconception is that everybody prior to this day and age just had a ton of kids. Um, and really, that's just not even true. Um, so foraging groups of people in terms of their reproduction, um, they spent several years in between having children. Um, they can they uh, breastfed for longer periods of time. And women had low levels of body fat because their subsistence strategies were extensive. Remember, they had to cover a lot of land to, to gather enough acorns or natural grains or whatever they were gathering. Um, so again, foraging or hunting and gathering would actually only produce uh, about two to three children. Um, diet work and breastfeeding keep progesterone levels low um, and can even stop ovulation if you have low body fat. Um, there's also um, not complete knowledge of the cycle was was uh, known among foraging groups. Also herbs can um, start or end um, menstruation. So there's a lot of well-known things, especially in the natural world. Uh, the Juwasi uh, women typically had two to three people to surviving into adulthood. So this is the norm for hunting and gathering. This is the norm for human populations, uh, again, prior to agriculture, prior to horticulture. Um, so there weren't a lot of people running around. And, and contrary to popular belief, there wasn't a lot of uh, infant mortality in terms of death uh, when and childbirth. Um, and that's because they had more access to kind of the natural environment. Um, also, modern medicine wasn't there to do C-sections and stuff like that. Um, but also, um, women, uh, they weren't having a lot of children, which is what increases the chances of, of, fem of infant mortality and female mortality um, with childbirth. Um, ultimately, what we see is kind of this um, process and change taking place with the Juwasi. Now that they've transitioned into farming, they have more children. So this is a, a quintessential... Um, kind of culture that has been, we've been able to kind of put it in a, a symbolic petri dish and study the, the differences of modes of production. Um, agriculture, obviously, mode of reproduction, um, we get more children. Even in horticulture, we're going to start getting more children and pastoralism as well. Uh, when we need intensive workers to farm or to herd animals, we need more people to do that work. Um, pronatalism as a term is a policy that encourages childbearing. Um, and this was apparent in early America. We were, um, agricultural and again, the family was kind of that main unit or entity. Um, the family still gets talked about a decent amount, not as much politically anymore, but again, a big reason for that was pushing productivity in the agricultural area. Again, more kids, uh, rise out of the need for a larger labor force. Um, we also have higher birth rates and of seven or more per woman. Um, this is, again, in the age of agriculture. Uh, large family, mostly sons, seen as the sign of wealth. And again, this is, has a lot to do with kind of the historic, patriotic um, passing down of land through the male. And again, remember when we're talking about band level or foraging communities and women having a lot more authority and power, um, land and private property were not a thing. Once we get into agriculture, we get land, private property, and it tends to be passed down more patril, uh, patrilineally, passed 
through the, the males in the family. Um, dropping birth rates correspond with mechanized farm machines. So the more that we intensify um, automation in uh, agriculture and or farms, we have a drop in birth rate. <clears throat> um, the industrial digital economy mode of reproduction Again, this is, we're back kind of to the foraging, hunting, gathering time span where we're looking at replacement level fertility, number of births to number of deaths. Um, and we're below replacement level fertility right now in America. The only thing that's keeping us kind of afloat is immigration. So in terms of immigration gets a lot of political debate. In terms of America, um, if we cut off all immigration, we will not have replacement. Um, which is an economic detriment in a capitalistic system where you need to have uh, more people feeding into systems like uh, the market. Um, new markets obviously requires new people to enter that labor force, uh, but also Social Security, Medicare, we need more people to pay into those. Otherwise, they will they'll go bankrupt because we won't have any new people paying into them. Um, and this is a, uh, this chart on the side is... Uh, Japanese pyramid and we can see their movement from agriculture uh, really towards kind of this more modern age and a forecast and really what it looks like is that top 60 to 80 percent is a huge bubble where they're kind of or um, 60 to, to 100 age group is, is a bigger chunk than the lower level so again we're gonna they're, they're gonna have problems with replacement um, so ultimately demographic uh, transitioning there's two phases. The first phase is lower mortality rate due to nutrition and health increase. So this is one of those things where we get more people, population grows. Second phase, uh, fertility rates decline like Japan, USA, and Germany. Um, because people start having less kids, uh, we get more into this kind of economic structure of children, um, how much they cost, what is our uh, career goals, all these other cultural things start to take place uh, when we industrialize further. Um, Good for overall environment because we're having less children, which is less carbon footprint, um, and then bad for labor and tax bases like I talked about earlier. Um, stratified reproduction is based on economic status. Again, um, a lot of times these things, uh, in terms of who's having children, uh, what we have is kind of the higher class or, or wealthy putting off um, children or having children, and really what that ends up being is kind of more medical attention for fertility and stuff like that. So some interesting things around uh, stratified reproduction. Um, population is aging, scientific and, and technology involved in, in all aspects of pregnancy. This is a big change too, and we'll get in more into pregnancy and child, um, child care and even adolescence um, in a bit. Culture and fertility. So um, one of the issues in anthropology um, not issues, but barriers, we'll call it, uh, it is the, the issue of sexual intercourse and what that looks like in terms of a cultural uh, component. Um, sexual intercourse tends to be a universal, intimate, and private thing, and it's not something anthropologists can gain an amic perspective on. You, people aren't going to just let you into their, their huts or their houses um, to observe these things, nor would it be ethical, and it's, it's, it's kind of in that realm. Um, so you have to reply on, uh, rely on reports and interviews, not observation. So again, this is one of those private structures of culture that is left out of a lot of anthropological conversation. Um, <clears throat> Melanowski in 1929 does study does a study on uh, sexuality of Troban, the Troban Islanders. Um, it does provide insight into disease transmission, and we really get into medical anthropology, which is an applied anthropology. Um, Menarche as a term is the onset of menstruation. Menopause is the cessation of menstruation where it stops. Uh, cultural rules guide sexual behavior. This is a cultural universal. Every culture has its own rules around um, sex, what age is appropriate, what it isn't, and these form norms and or taboos. Um, ideology guides. This gets more into maybe even religious practices. Hinduism uh, preaches abstinence on holy and sacred days. And the big question to me is, or to you is why, right? So there's abstinence on holy days. Outside of that, it's then when you get into um, the Kama Sutra and some of these other interesting um, sexual uh, explicit kind of books and or teachings. Um, Cross-cultural sexual practices. This is, again, trying to iterate the idea that, that um, sex is so different in different cultures all over the place. In New Guinea, sex is only for reproduction in, in certain tribal groups. It's only for reproduction. It is... Uh, 
not seen as 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 something to utilize outside of reproduction. Um, Mangaia is an island in in the South Pacific. Sex exists for both pleasure and procreation as a principal interest and activity. So the Mangaian boys uh, hear a mas uh, masturbation at age seven and they begin to practice uh, sex at age eight or nine, or sorry, not sex, but uh, masturbation. And then at age 13, they undergo kind of a super incision or a, a super incision um, uh, circumcision ritual um and it's made at the the top of the penis along the entire length and the expert who performs the surgery gives him um explicit sexual instruction so this is a this is a at 13 he's going through a rite of passage sexually about two weeks after the operation the boy has intercourse with an experienced woman who provides him with a practice in various acts and positions she specifically trains him uh in restraint um so that ultimately um he can stimulate not only himself but but his partner um the young girls receive similar expert instruction. Um, and they have three to four successive boyfriends between the ages of 13 and 20. Um, parents encourage the daughters to have sexual experiences with several men. So they don't, they, when they find a marriage partner, um, it's congenial. Um, boys kind of aggressively seek out girls, typically having um, sex every night. Um, the average boy uh, may have 10 or more girlfriends before marriage. Um, at a rage, at around age 18, uh, the Magayans, uh, typically have sex most nights of the week, about three orgasms per night. Um, and it's, so as you can see, I don't need to like be exp like any more kind of descriptive. Um, what you can see is there are two polar opposite cultures and they're in the same kind of region of the world. Um, we have the South Pacific Island and we have Papua New Guinea, who is the, that is also kind of in the South Pacific, um, moving more towards the Indian Ocean and above Australia. And the New Guinea population is only having sex for reproduction and it's seen as bad and women's menstruations are seen as a uh, pollutant. Um, and then you have this other Island where it's, it's very laid out and very open and, um, uh, kind of a more, uh, structured system of kind of sexual experience going through different processes, but definitely more encouraged and not seen as, as a bad thing. Um, so what I'm trying to show you again is this cultural, uh, uh, continuum, um, or spectrum where over here you have a, a culture group that has these strict rules around sex is only for reproduction. And then you have these, uh, this other group with strict rules, but it's more about how to, um, properly kind of, uh, deal with, with sex on an everyday basis. So very different. Um, microculture pressures, uh, Children's labor value, um, we get into kind of children's value as taking care of elderly parents. So these are different things, right? Dude, are we having children to, to tend for the, the farm? Um, are we having children to take care of us when we get older? Different cultures have these things. Infinite child mortality rates and economic costs of children are also something that plays into our family decisions to have kids. And that's what microcultural pressures mean. Um, Really, is it is it family pressure, right? Are the, are your parent are the grandparents pressuring you into having kids? And then we get into subculture and macro pressures, which is, um, I would say that are kind of a, a macro pressure at least is um, for those kind of college educated individuals is putting off having children as long as they can um, until they kind of get a degree and a career, which is fascinating because you you hear that from from maybe a macro or subculture and then the other micro culture you might get your parents or your grandparents telling you to have children in your early 20s right after you get married um, like they did so some interesting kind of uh, conflicts there uh, global pressure for, there are 7.4 billion people and everyone in a developed country is a larger strain on the environment so again the united states represents about 25 percent of uh, resource use in the in the world of the world's resources uh, fertility controls are almost uh, universal as well uh, a lot of people think that hunter-gatherer, forager people didn't have things for um, that could cause abortions or um, uh, pregnancy controls or even um, birth control. And really what we have is abortifacents, herbs, and practices that indigenous uh, populations used, but also there was birth control herbs as well. Infanticide was used only when absolutely necessary for survival where they would leave the infant outside of the hut at night and let nature kind of take its course. Kind of brutal in our minds, but real for surviving in these 